Hello, my name is Edward Black. I'm a lifelong resident of the state of Minnesota and pleased to be associated with the University of Minnesota and the Earl E. Bakken Medical Devices Center. I've been asked before how someone becomes a reimbursement expert. My best answer has always been to work for a health plan for a few years. I worked at the Blue Cross and Blue Shield system for over 25 years before moving into medical technology consulting in 2008. I founded my own company and operated independently until that company was acquired by NAMSA Consulting in Minneapolis in 2008. I've traveled and lectured internationally in countries such as Canada, Ireland, the UK, Germany, the Nordic countries, Japan, China, and Australia. And as confusing as our healthcare system is to Americans, it's even more difficult to navigate for foreign-based companies. After working inside the payer system so long, I still have that bias of a payer, but working from the payer perspective has given a unique insight into what is required for successful medical technology reimbursement. Prior to passage of the 2010 Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, better known as Obamacare, new medical technologies generally found their way into coverage by government and commercial insurance companies with only modest industry effort. The act emboldened health plans to do what they always wanted to do, put more emphasis on the development of clinical evidence. This course is divided into two main topics. We'll talk about reimbursement essentials, such as coding, payment, and coverage, and the optimal planning process. First of all, let's define what is reimbursement. Reimbursement is the set of strategies, activities, and processes that medical tech companies must require to ensure that their devices are adequately paid and covered by government and commercial insurance companies. The essential barriers to reimbursement are product and procedure coding, payment methodology, and coverage from government and commercial insurance companies. We won't go into much detail discussing health economics, health economics in this presentation, it's important to note, though, that cost-effectiveness analyses are most useful when trying to convince a payer that a technology, though more expensive, is more effective. ICERs are simply helpful to payers and health researchers who depend heavily on models that assess changes in quality of life, and budget impact models are particularly helpful for hospitals when considering the impact of a technology on their net revenue. So let's define coding, payment, and coverage, because those three things essentially equal what we refer to as reimbursement. Coding is the question of whether or not there is a code that describes your device or the manner in which physicians will use it. Payment is an analysis of how hospitals and physicians are paid, hopefully paid enough to encourage product adoption without being too expensive, thereby prohibiting government and commercial insurance coverage. And finally, coverage is the question of whether Medicare and private insurance companies will cover the device or the procedure it enables, and if so, under what clinical circumstances. This is the three-legged stool of reimbursement. And just as you cannot sit on a stool that only has one or two legs, a technology that lacks one of these three fundamentals may not achieve long-term success. These variables are independently developed, but highly interdependent. Let's talk about coding first. There is CPT coding, HCPCS coding, and ICD-10 coding. CPT stands for Current Procedural Terminology. It is controlled by the American Medical Association and describes professional services rendered by physicians or other healthcare professionals. It's also referred to as Level 1 of HCPCS coding. HCPCS Level 2 codes describe products these are controlled by the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. The full explanation of HCPCS is Healthcare Common Procedure Code System. And finally, International Classification of Diseases, 10th edition, PCS, describes hospital inpatient services, ICD-10-CM describes diagnoses, and these are controlled by the World Health Organization. Government and commercial insurers process healthcare data just like banks. They're dependent upon the precision of numbers to describe procedures 
rather than long narrative descriptions. Therefore, medical technology must be reduced to numbers in order for healthcare providers and payers to effectively communicate. Every physician's service is described by a CPT code, either a unique code or by a code representing a group of common services. They are controlled by the American Medical Association and a panel of about 20 people called the CPT Editorial Panel, which determines what services or procedures get new codes. The process is supported by medical societies representing specialty groups of orthopedists, cardiologists, family practitioners, urologists, and all the professional medical societies. The process is only semi-transparent, subjective, sometimes political, and physicians and payers take the process very seriously. We've cited three examples of neurostimulation CPT codes. 64566 is for percutaneous or posterior tibial nerve stimulation. Close to that is 64568, an incision for implantation of a cranial nerve neurostimulator electrode array. 90867 is used to describe therapeutic repetitive transcranial magnetic stimulation treatment. In all, there are about 11,000 CPT codes. There are five essential criteria for creating a new CPT code or modifying an existing one. I've highlighted the two most challenging criteria in red. Both of these criteria are highly subjective. The term many physicians in the second point is determined subjectively by dividing the total number of specialists who might do the procedure by those who have actually done it. More complex procedures reduce the total number of available physicians and those who have been trained. Medical society guidance is critical in this determination. Either way, the important point is, is that the procedure must already be in use by physicians in the U.S. and the clinical evidence of those services must be well established and documented in U.S. peer-reviewed, publicly available literature. The evidence requirements for obtaining a new CPT code are greater than what is required to obtain FDA clearance, and even more evidence is required to secure coverage than for coding. The Healthcare Common Procedure Code Level 1 Category 1 CPT code evidence requirements requires at least five peer-reviewed published references. At least three of those five must report the procedure in a U.S. patient population. Of these, at least two articles must support different patient populations or have different authors, and at least one of the publications must be based on results from well-designed, non-experimental, descriptive studies, such as comparative studies, correlation studies, or case control studies. Far too many companies wait until they achieve FDA clearance for their device until they consider whether or not the service it enables can be described in CPT. The AMA has prescribed amounts of peer-reviewed published evidence required for consideration of a code, and in recent years, the CPT panel has held more strictly enforcement of these requirements among the medical societies that recommend their passage. The default for a Category 1 CPT code is a Category 3 temporary code, of which you may have heard. Such codes are reserved for new and emerging technologies and exist for up to five years, after which they are either extended, sunset, or upgraded to a Category 1 status when clinical evidence and utilization criteria merit. Category 3 CPT codes, however, are rarely paid by Medicare and commercial insurers, leaving developers a long time to commercialization. Let's talk about HCPCS Level 2 coding for durable medical equipment, prosthetics, orthotics, and supplies. DME is generally defined by CMS as the equipment used in the home, which can withstand repeated use, is primarily and customarily used to serve a medical purpose, has an expected life of at least three years, and is generally not useful in the absence of an illness or an injury. This definition excludes hospital capital expense items, surgical tools, and single-use or disposable items used solely in the hospital. Prosthetics, orthotics, and supplies include things like ostomy supplies, diabetes supplies, 
orthopedic braces, wound care products, bioengineered skin substitute products, and thousands of other products that have been cleared by the FDA. DME POS coding is controlled by CMS, The commercial insurers can create their own special codes for services that Medicare does not cover. And these codes tend to be relatively generic and payers prefer to lump most new technology into existing level two codes for ease of maintenance. There are thousands of FDA cleared devices on the US market that do not fit into existing healthcare common procedure code systems. Many of these were not intended for coverage by government and commercial insurers Others were designed for third-party coverage and require that to be successful. A third category of devices falls somewhere in between. Coding databases are expensive for insurance to maintain. Therefore, their tendency is to keep the simple system simple and try to include any similar products they want to cover into existing codes. Some believe this tends to stifle innovation Only those devices that cannot be described by an existing code are considered for a new code, and then only if it is a product that Medicare, Medicaid, or commercial insurers intend to cover. Here are some examples of HICPIC Level 2 product codes for Neurotech. You can see three C-prefixed HICPIC codes. The C-prefix codes are typically used for Medicare billing, codes that are preceded by an L, are more often used by private payers. And finally, we'll touch on International Classification of Diseases, CM and PCS codes. ICD-10 codes are used to authorize and calculate trillions of dollars of payments from Medicare, Medicaid, TRICARE, Veterans Health Administration, and commercial insurers paid to hospitals, physicians, and other health care providers and suppliers. The millions of combinations of codes will allow for better analyses of disease patterns and to process medical benefit claims. Diagnosis codes, there are about 68,000 codes which are reported by all healthcare institutions. The ICD-10 procedure codes are used strictly for hospitals for reporting inpatient services. Remember, hospitals report ICD-10 PCS codes for inpatient services Physicians report with CPT. And an even more complex matrix of 87,000 codes exist for hospital-based procedures, which is 29 times more codes than was in the ninth edition. Issuance of these codes is controlled by CMS. This process is easier and more transparent than the CPT process. An example for an inpatient spinal cord stimulator is indicated below. These are seven-digit codes a combination of alpha numeric characters. Each one represents either a medical or surgical procedure. A zero indicates it's done in the central nervous system and cranial nerves. Others reflect the location and the technique by which those are implanted. As a takeaway on this very first subject of coding, I would encourage you to think of coding as the language by which payers and providers communicate. And they take this very seriously. If your technology or service does not fit into a code, it is very difficult for providers to get paid and it discourages device adoption. So plan early. These are prescribed processes and criteria that could require years before you can achieve appropriate coding. I have a question for you to consider at this point in time. If you've developed a neurostimulation device for the treatment of overactive bladder, which of the following medical societies do you believe would be most important to engage with for CPT coding support if that was needed? A, the American Neurological Association, B, the North American Neuromodulation Society, or C, the American Congress of OBGYNs? The best answer is really all three. The American Neurological Association has primary accountability for the management of CPT codes for overactive bladder, but most women consult their OBGYNs for urology problems, and the North American Neurological Society has become increasingly influential in recent years in CPT decision-making, and they will be involved in all nerve stimulation coding decisions for consistency across therapeutic disciplines. Let's move on to talk about payment methodologies. 
and there are different payment methodologies for every setting of service. Inpatient hospital services are paid according to diagnosis-related groups. Outpatient hospital services are paid according to ambulatory payment classifications. Ambulatory surgery centers are paid off of a fixed fee schedule. Physicians are compensated under the resource-based relative value system. Durable medical equipment, prosthetics, orthotics, and supplies are paid on a fee schedule, as are clinical laboratory services. For inpatient hospital payment, DRGs have been the standard of care for many years. There are about 900 DRGs to which any admission will be assigned based on ICD-10 defined diagnosis and procedure codes and the resources required to care for the average patient. Each DRG has a weight that is multiplied by a conversion factor to determine the payment. A higher weight is usually associated with a longer hospital stay and a more severe illness. A new technology pass-through payment allows 50% of the cost of new technologies to be paid for a period of two to three years to meet a cost threshold and achieve substantial clinical improvement. After that period of time, the DRG weights are adjusted to account for the increased cost. This requires a special application to the federal Medicare program. Historically, though, only about one out of six applications get approved and these decisions are not binding on commercial insurance companies. Because revenue is fixed, hospitals will more readily adopt expensive technologies that are clinically comparable or superior. Government and commercial insurers apply different conversion factors to payment. The DRG system was created on the basis of averaging payments for admissions that required similar hospital resources, Within each DRG, there are some admissions whose costs are below payment, others are above the payment rate. Hospital Value Analysis Committees, or VACs, are relatively new committees of internal hospital personnel who evaluate whether or not adoption of a new technology provides sufficient value for its cost. This often requires a budget impact model, one of many health economic analyses, to help hospitals understand if your technology presents an economic gain or a loss for the hospital. APCs, or ambulatory payment classifications, work essentially the same way. In recent years, Medicare has started bundling primary procedures with secondary procedures and in service into what they call comprehensive APCs. Like inpatient services, a new technology add-on payment is available for new technology devices that demonstrate substantial clinical improvement and whose costs are 25% or more of the APC. This works similar to the other program on the inpatient side where half the cost of these novel technologies can be paid in addition to the APC payment and these last for about two to three years. There's another special payment provision called a new technology APC which can be created for procedures that are represent truly novel devices. Ambulatory payment centers, it should be noted, get paid about 40% less than hospital outpatient departments because they have lower fixed costs and take on less complex cases. We've put together some examples of payments for neurotechnology based on the 2021 Medicare National Average Fee Schedule for Hospitals. You can see they aggregate these into five different levels with um, payment rates beginning at $3,500 and going up almost to $30,000 for what is defined as a level five neurostimulator and related procedure. Each new neurostimulator device that comes to the market will likely be paid according to these one of these five levels depending on the complexity and cost of the device and the related hospital services. For truly novel expensive technologies that are assigned to a new technology APC or a new technology pass-through payment, that's also a possibility, which is a significant enhancement to market adoption for any new technology. And again, these APCs are five of about 400 APCs into which other services could be categorized for payment by the federal Medicare program most commercial insurers have adopted similar payment methodologies, but they apply their own conversion factors for payment, 
which typically results in a payment of up to 35, maybe 40 percent more than the federal Medicare program. Finally, there is physician reimbursement, referred to as the resource-based relative value system. Every CPT code that is a Category 1 code is assigned an RVU reflective of these three factors. The work expense, which is the skill, time, and decision-making required for the procedure. The practice expense, which is the overhead cost for a specific procedure that would be nursing, staff, clinic operations. It includes the technology costs when a procedure is done in an office-based practice. And the malpractice expense, which is the liability risk posed by the specific procedure. We've provided the three RVUs and the conversion factor and Medicare payment allowance for those three CPT-coded neurostimulation devices described earlier under the coding section. You can see for the first one, CPT-64566 for posterior tibial nerve stimulation. That has 3.5 RVUs. You multiply that by the Medicare national average conversion factor of $32.41. That gives the physician allowance of $116.35 for doing a single treatment in an office-based practice. The other codes operate in the, very much the same way. And you can see the complexity of the procedure reflected in the RVUs. The conversion factor is consistent for Medicare, which yields then the allowance for the service. After going through this calculation, Medicare applies a geographic adjustment factor to account for the higher cost of doing business in different parts of the U.S. It should be noted that 2021 Medicare conversion factor of $32.41 is a reduction of 10.2% from fiscal year 2020. Have to keep in mind though that the, the RVUs get adjusted a bit from year to year, but a reduction of 10% of the conversion factor is a significant reduction in the payment for physician services that will occur in fiscal year 2021. And as I noted before, commercial insurers will negotiate their own conversion factors which are consistently higher than Medicare's. It's another reason that physicians and even hospitals look at payer mix to understand the affordability of adopting new technology. RVUs are recommended by another AMA CPT committee, euphemistically referred to as the RUC, or the Relative Value Update Committee. Once a Category 1 CPT code is established by the editorial panel, a different group, the RUC, assigns these RVUs. They're composed of 20 physicians who debate the relative value of one procedure compared to others across all the different medical surgical disciplines. The result of their work is the establishment of RVUs which payers use as the basis for payment, though Medicare and private insurers can choose to institute their own RVUs if they de disagree with the RUC recommendations. And note again that Category 3 codes for new and emerging technologies do not get assigned RVUs because they are rarely covered and paid anyway. And finally, the DME POS fee schedule is established and maintained by the federal Medicare program Every HICPIC code, every HICPIC product code gets assigned to the fee schedule. And if your product fits the definition of the code, it will be automatically paid according to that allowance for the code, regardless of any unique features it may have that distinguish it from other products in that same category. The fee schedule is revised annually by CMS. However, CMS is moving more toward competitive bidding for similar products in multiple categories. And you should be aware of these before pricing a product or designing a product that is maybe more sophisticated and more expensive because payment is going to be relegated to the average cost of all these devices associated with a particular code. Private insurers generally do not maintain their own database of allowances because it's expensive to maintain. They typically will just apply a discount or a slight increase above the Medicare standard schedule for payment of DME, which in the global cost of healthcare does not amount to a great deal. In summary, when we think about payment, you must consider that payment for most hospital, physician, 
and DME and supply services and supplies are predetermined. You must understand this to determine its effect on your technology adoption. Government and commercial insurers all have different payment rates, leading providers to think about the payment mix, and devices that are less expensive and provide comparable or better clinical results are easy for providers who are paid on a fixed revenue basis to adopt. Let's ask another question here. The question is, why do payment rates vary so much? I'll give you three possible answers. A, Medicare is the largest single payer and therefore exerts significant pricing leverage. B, commercial insurers try to keep within close range of each other in payment levels for competitive purposes. Or C, payment level drives the bulk of the cost of care. The correct answer is really A. Commercial insurers drive hard negotiations to try to gain a competitive advantage. And most economists will advise that in the U.S., the utilization rate of services drives the cost of care more than the cost per service. Let's talk now about coverage of new technology. Among coding, payment, and coverage, obtaining commercial and government insurance coverage has become the greatest potential barrier to successful medical technology commercialization. There are over a thousand health plan organizations that make medical policy coverage decisions, some on their own, some follow Medicare, some follow other external technology assessments. Unlike FDA clearance, which is an extremely important, but it's a single sentinel event. Securing government and commercial insurance coverage requires many small and large successes, which typically occur over an extended period of time, years for most technologies. There really are no standards for evidence for coverage, unlike there are for CPT coding. You require volumes of high quality, peer reviewed, published clinical evidence required for coverage of any technology, but payer opinions on how much and the quality of the evidence vary widely. Clinical evidence developed outside the U.S. is not highly valued by payers because medicine is practiced differently in different countries. It's even practiced differently in different parts of the United States. The larger the commercial payer, organizations such as United Healthcare, Aetna, Anthem, Blue Cross, and Blue Shield, the more evidence that will be required. Big companies cannot easily reverse bad decisions so they're more cautious to extend coverage in the first place. Some payers will make decisions based on clinical evidence alone. Others will consider cost-effective analyses, and this is becoming more common. Just as clinicians will often read the same laboratory and radiological imaging reports and come to different conclusions about the best course of treatment for a patient, medical policy decision makers will have different opinions. The burden of proof lies with the manufacturing technology. This is where I believe payer perspective and reimbursement becomes most helpful. The Hippocratic Oath commits healthcare professionals to apply the benefit of the sick, all measures that are required, avoiding those twin traps of overtreatment and therapeutic nihilism. While healthcare professionals are committed to each individual patient, health plans are responsible for medical policy decision-making for large populations of people. Consequently, they view medical necessity differently. There are several technology evaluation groups. Here you will see the most highly regarded ones. The Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association Technology Evaluation Committee, Aetna Technology Assessment, California Technology Assessment Committee, ECRI Institute, and Hayes Research. The BCBSA Aetna and Caltechs are generally considered the most rigorous review processes. These assessments are frequently cited in each other's medical policies. ECRI and Hayes are proprietary subscription-based services. They provide tech assessments and less rigorous reviews primarily to small insurers who lack the resources to do their own. There are several private organizations that will evaluate new technologies and these are the most recognized organizations. As mentioned before, there are over a thousand commercial insurance companies who will make those decisions. 
small organizations may follow Medicare coverage guidance or purchase technology assessments from other organizations, but these policies vary dramatically over different geographies and at different periods of time, and they do not automatically update these policies on any regularly scheduled basis. This is where a lot of coverage advocacy work really becomes important. Here you see the long-standing criteria by which the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association evaluates new technology. One of these criteria will be the most important to each new technology, but the challenge is to understand where payer objections reside and to plan clinical trials with that understanding. I've highlighted the two criteria that cause most technologies to fail to obtain coverage. Just because a new device or therapy is cleared by the FDA does not mean that it is as beneficial as other therapies. Health plan medical policy people will carefully review peer-reviewed published clinical evidence and compare the results of these new therapies against the current standard of care. They are under no obligation to cover new therapies just because they're FDA cleared. When designing clinical trials, it's important to segment the population. Commercial insurers generally cover people under age 65, including pediatric patients, and if your study population does not include these age segments, you will have trouble. Conversely, it's very difficult to convince Medicare to cover a technology if your study does not have a large component of people over the age 65. When we talk about this in greater detail, it should be obvious that clinical improvement is much more easily attained within the confines of a controlled clinical study. This is identified on point number five, where the improvement must be attainable outside the investigative setting. These two really pose the greatest challenges for medical technology entrepreneurs. Coverage decision-making is not perfect, and commercial insurers like Medicare will rely primarily on the following to make coverage decisions. Peer-reviewed published clinical literature, for which there are few benchmarks for volume, evaluation of evidence for safety and effectiveness, clinical guidelines adopted by affected medical societies, documented cost effectiveness, and a note that key opinion leaders in industry lobbying is really minimally effective. Medical policy decision makers can view the same evidence differently, thereby yielding different clinical decisions, even within government payers. Medical policy decision makers for Medicare do not directly account for the cost of new technologies when considering coverage. Commercial insurers are not so constrained. In this slide, you will see the huge variation in the types and funding sources of government and commercial insurance. Our system of insurance in the U.S. is highly complex and causes considerable administrative burden for providers and payers. Standardized coding systems help with this, but different payment amounts and coverage policy make the system complicated to navigate. Payer mixes represented on this slide the presence or absence of government or commercial insurance coverage and varying payment levels among them have a significant impact on hospital and physician willingness to adopt new technology. Coverage is a particular challenge within the federal Medicare program. Part A and Part B jurisdictions exist within the U.S. for the administration of hospital and physician benefits. What a lot of organizations do not realize that even though Medicare is a central administrative authority. It contracts with seven private organizations across 12 different jurisdictions to administer the program. This is where claims processing, day-to-day -day operations, and medical policy decision-making is made under contract to these seven private organizations. Coverage can be extended either through national coverage decisions made by the CMS office in Baltimore or via local coverage determination in any one of these regional Medicare administrative contractors. And the vast majority of coverage decisions are made by the regional Medicare administrative contractors. While they try to be consistent, that is not always the case, and their schedules for policy review vary. Consequently, there are services covered for Medicare beneficiaries in some jurisdictions, but not others. 
Similar situation exists with durable medical equipment, orthotics, and supplies, where there are four jurisdictions and two Medicare administrative contractors. They operate similar to the Part A and Part B jurisdictions. So let's recap what we learned about coverage issues. Coverage determinations vary by payer, even within government payers. There are no clear standards for evidence. You can only find guidance by example when you examine how other covered technologies built their evidence base. You must think about evidence as a component of coverage, not merely to establish safety and effectiveness for FDA clearance. Let's pose question number three. Why do government and commercial insurers have medical policies that vary so widely? A, commercial insurers all want to be the last to cover new technologies so they can save money. B, the coverage decision-making process among commercial insurers is very non-transparent, sometimes arbitrary. Or C, there are no standards by which reasonable people will come to the same conclusion about how much evidence is enough. You could say all three, but C is really the best answer. I've worked with several health plan medical directors who are very conscientious men and women who have a fiduciary responsibility to the insured populations they cover, and they take their jobs very seriously, but they do look and compare current therapies to new therapies and will make determinations on which ones can be best be managed and which ones generally achieve the greatest outcome for the greatest populations. Again, health plans think about populations of people and not individual patients. Here's a case example for a neurotechnology company of which I'm sure you've all heard. Second Sight is a med tech company that was founded back in 1998 in Silmar, California. The company researched, designed, and created the world's first FDA and CE marked approved device for providing artificial vision in people with late stage retinitis pigmentosa. When we look at coding and coverage payment issues for this technology, we find that they did go through and achieve a category three CPT code. It is described here as placement of a subconjunctival retinal prosthesis receiver and pulse generator and implantation of interocular retinal electrode array with vitrectomy. Note this is a category three temporary CPT code as noted by the T suffix. It means this was obtained with minimal clinical evidence, which is a, a short pathway to getting a code but it's less likely to be covered in those circumstances. The technology also has a HCPCS level two product code, L8608, miscellaneous external component, supply or accessory for use with the Argus II retinal prosthesis system. This HCPCS code, as you will note, is specific to the Argus II. We'll now talk about how the Argus II is paid. In 2019, CMS approved a Medicare hospital outpatient payment of $152,500 for the Argus II system and the associated procedure. You recall prior presentations, we talked about a new technology APC. Second site was awarded a new tech APC because the cost of this device was so high and it did not fit into an existing APC. You recall the APCs for neurostimulation devices began at about $3,500 and capped out at $30,000. They agreed to create a special APC for this because the technology had specific promise and would be used on a limited population. According to the company, the Argus II system is presently reimbursed through a majority of Medicare administrative contractors and Medicare Advantage plans operating in the geographic areas where coverage exists. Also, many private insurance companies apparently pay for Argus II on a case-by-case -case basis. This was a quote directly from the company website. So let's look overall at, at um, a summary of the Argus II. It's an example of a technology that uniquely identifies how challenging and expensive novel technologies can be 
particularly those that require special considerations in coding, payment, and coverage. The implantation required a Category 3 procedure code because it's a unique, low-volume, but highly complex procedure with a small potential market. A HICPIC product code is required because of the implantable component as well as the external components. A new technology APC payment was assigned because the system cost could not be accounted for in any existing APC. And coverage occurs in a case-by-case -case or an exception basis until such time, if any, that the system can demonstrate consistent success in restoring sight to patients with RP on a broad and consistent basis. It's a really interesting neurotechnology example from a reimbursement perspective. We're going to talk now about what we believe to be the optimal planning process. And it's a discussion briefly about the difference between the FDA and CMS and what that planning process looks like for medical technologies. I've presented this slide to audiences for several years, and I still believe it captures the essence of how the FDA and CMS view the world. Both federal agencies are under the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, but they have clearly different responsibilities. The FDA will recruit homogeneous groups of patients upon which they will do clinical studies to test the safety and effectiveness of a new technology. Patients in these clinical studies get strong support. They're carefully selected to be into the program. The physicians, hospitals, other health professionals adhere to strict study and quality controls, and there's clinical oversight in every step of the process. These studies are done at the leading medical centers by key opinion leaders, those who practice the science of medicine. The total result of this is an effort to secure a predicate device in many circumstances using non-inferiority-based studies. In many cases, that's what's required to create safe and effective devices for the U.S. market. When you move over to CMS and consider that as representative of third-party payers in general, once the technology is approved and used in the public domain, it is not used on homogeneous group of patients. And a lot of patients are non-compliant, either because they don't understand follow-up instructions or they can't afford them in the case of certain medications. Physicians will practice fee-for-service medicine. They can take a technology and use it off-label, even though you can't promote it for that purpose. And we all know that physician skill varies widely and is highly dependent upon the number of and volume of services provided by an institution and the skill and experience developed by the professional medical team. Once the technology is approved, and if it's designed primarily for surgical specialists, generalists are not constrained from using that. So you have all types of clinical providers and specialists who may use the procedure, those who may practice the art of medicine as well as the science of medicine. And finally, payers are busy people, they maintain a huge database of medical policies, and they're looking for technologies that are clinically superior and not those that just meet the safety and effectiveness criteria of predicate-based devices. And that's why CMS developed the mantra, reasonable and necessary, because not all technologies that are safe and effective are reasonable and necessary for patient care, and particularly for specific patient populations. It is the real divergence of these perspectives that has caused reimbursement to become what I consider a greater barrier to adoption than achieving FDA clearance. This particular slide is one we've used for quite some time and it's relatively simple, but it seeks to point out where we believe reimbursement planning really needs to occur. And you'll see that in the second step. We believe regulatory and reimbursement strategies need to be developed hand in hand. Too many companies think about reimbursement far too late in the process. Ideally, reimbursement planning should coincide with regulatory planning. It is during this phase that companies need to identify the clinical evidence needed to develop in order to establish safety and effectiveness for the FDA, but also to satisfy reasonable and necessary criteria for broad health plan coverage. 
It is from this planning that a clinical and publication strategy emerges. Oftentimes, you can talk to CMS, to the coverage and analysis group, to get a reaction to the type of evidence that may be required to cover a new technology. Under certain circumstances, third-party payers, commercial insurers, will make medical policy people available to talk about their perceptions of new technology and the evidence may be required. And medical policies are generally available on uh, health plan databases as well as through CMS. And you can seek guidance and current positions from these health plans about the coverage status of current technologies, both um, those that are covered and those that are not covered. Those are really important pieces of work to do before developing a clinical strategy. So when you have that information and have some understanding about what type of clinical evidence may be required to meet reasonable and necessary criteria and safety and effectiveness is when you begin to develop the clinical plan and not before. The clinical plan based on evidence requirements will drive the clinical strategy, the publication strategy, so that by the time you secure regulatory approval based on the completed studies, you should be in a position to secure coverage through government and commercial insurance companies. Failure to do so means you may have to go all the way backwards in the process and develop evidence specific to secure coverage if you did not consider that comprehensively at the very beginning of the process. I like to call this the Candyland slide. If you think of the kid's, name, the kid's game Candyland, you move through these colored squares and you have a chance at the end you might draw a card that sends you all the way back to start. And that's what can happen to companies that don't plan early for reimbursement for medical technology companies. We encourage you to link regulatory reimbursement and market planning. For the regulatory piece, engage with regulator regulators early. Do your pre-submission FDA meetings. With reimbursement, you can engage with health plan medical policy decision makers early to understand expectations for coverage. You can research their coverage guidance for all different kinds of technologies, not only in neurostimulation, neuromodulation, but in all therapeutic areas and get great insight into why they do or do not cover certain types of technologies. You can engage with the AMA and in some circumstances medical societies for coding and clinical guidance that they perceive are going to be necessary even to achieve a CPT code or to answer some of their concerns about a technology, particularly if you want them to develop a clinical guideline for use of your technology once it is out on the market. And that work really all needs to be incorporated into the marketing plan where you can engage with key opinion leaders and end users to make certain that the studies you're designing meet their needs as well. All of this information feeds back into developing a regulatory, clinical, marketing, and reimbursement strategies necessary to be successful in the commercial market. The project plan simply and identified by bullet point talks about defining company goals, whether you want to be the first in the market, paid highest, or develop the greatest technology in that therapeutic area so you become the standard of care. You want to define the device, its intended use and mode of action, complete a market assessment, define the standard of care, define the desired marketing and labeling claims, complete your regulatory assessment, device classification and route to market, current requirements, assess potential to leverage data across several regions for several purposes, complete a reimbursement landscape assessment to understand for potential barriers in coding, payment, and coverage, develop a clinical strategy that responds to regulatory and reimbursement requirements, and create a publication plan that will meet requirements of all vested stakeholders. Remember, when thinking about planning, the FDA and CMS have distinctly different responsibilities that must be understood. Link regulatory and reimbursement planning to maximize efficiency in the development of clinical evidence. Research medical coverage policies and technology assessments to determine the evidence you must develop to successfully commercialize. And we'll pose question number four to this group now. Why is it so important to link reimbursement and regulatory planning. A, it is best to know early 
if a technology will fail to achieve coverage or be insufficiently paid and therefore not adopted by providers. B. Regulatory provisions for human device exemption, breakthrough status, and Category A experimental or Category B investigative studies, as designated by the FDA, can affect evidence requirements for coverage and the ability to get devices paid during an approved IDE study. Or C. Clinical trials can be very expensive and time-consuming. Failure to anticipate payer requirements for coverage and to plan accordingly can cost thousands and thousands of dollars in years of time. It's pretty easy. The answer is all three. They're all very important considerations, and that's why we stress thinking about these things very early in the planning process. We encourage you to start early. We've never heard of anyone say they started their reimbursement planning process too early. Incorporate your reimbursement planning with regulatory planning to create the clinical and publication strategies that will be required for success. And remember, venture capitalists are investors, not philanthropists. They know how your device is likely to get paid. If you don't know, you may not get funded. Thank you, and we wish you great success in your technology entrepreneurship.